Amen. What a chapter. I love the book of Hebrews. That's not our text for this afternoon. <laughs> Go to 1 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians 11 will be our text, but Hebrews gives us a lot of insight as to angels and their job and what they do, so we'll make reference to that. I'll go back to it a little bit throughout the sermon, but I want to go back to 1 Corinthians 11. You remember we read uh, this when we were talking about the Lord's Supper and the different ordinances he was saying. Uh, so let's read uh, 1 Corinthians 11, verse 16, verses. Paul said, Be ye followers of me, even as I also am of Christ. <coughs> Now I praise you, brethren, that ye remember me in all things, and keep the ordinances as I have delivered them to you. But I would have you to know that the head of every man is Christ, and the head of the woman is the man, and the head of Christ is God. Every man praying and prophesying, having his head covered, dishonoreth his head. But every woman that prayeth or prophesieth with her head uncovered, dishonoreth her her head for that is even as one as if she were shaven for if the woman be not covered let her also be shorn but if it be a shame for a woman to be shorn or shaven let her be covered for a man indeed ought not to cover his head for as much as he is the image and glory of God but the woman is the glory of the man for the man is not of the woman but the woman of the man Neither was the man created for the woman, but the woman for the man. For this cause ought the woman to have power on her head because of the angels. Nevertheless, neither is the man without the woman, neither the woman without the man in the Lord. For as the woman is of the man, even so is the man also by the woman, but all things of God. Judge in yourselves. Is it comely that a woman... Pray unto God uncovered. Doth not even nature itself teach you that if a man have long hair, it is a shame unto him? But if a woman have long hair, it is glory to her, for her hair is given her for a covering. But if any man seem to be contentious, we have no such custom, neither the churches of God. Now this chapter is not a popular chapter to be preached today. In fact, I'd say if you start talking to somebody about how we believe women ought to have long hair, they'd say you must be in a cult or something. What is this a, a weird thing that you're teaching? And uh, so obviously this is not a passage that is preached maybe a whole lot, uh, but I particularly, and I won't necessarily ex explain all of this, but I particularly want to pay, uh, go back and pay attention to where it says, uh, that a woman, uh, on verse 10, for this cause ought the woman to have power on her head because of the angels. How many in here think they have a pretty good idea what that means? Mm -hmm. <laughs> All right. I'm not saying you will after this sermon is over, but you can see why I feel like uh, it's an interesting passage to, uh, to tackle. All right, I've made reference to this a lot of times, and, and my way of handling was basically, I have no idea what that means. And so I took this approach to it. I said, here's what we're going to do. We're going to look at what the context is talking about in terms of ladies with long hair, men with short hair. We're going to look at what the, primarily this is what the message will be, going, uh, the different points will be, what is the ministry, what are the ministries of angels? What's an angel's role when it comes to praying, prophesying, you know, what, what do the angels have to do with this? And then we'll go back, Lord willing, and we'll look at that original, uh, this original passage and try to get an idea here about what this is talking about. I think it'll help us. The application, if I get off at all on, applying, uh, on, on actually defining what this phrase means, if I get off at all, that's okay, because the application is still going to be true <laughs> at the end of this, all right? So let's do this. First of all, First of all, what in the world is the significance of a woman having long hair? Why is it important? Was it even true? Because here's what a lot of people will say, well, that's talking about a veil. You know, that's talking about having uh, their head covered for these different reasons. And, you know, some will try everything they can to show uh, where that was, you know, not something that all the women uh, necessarily did. 
I don't think you can get around it in the Bible. Now, you could try to say, you know, well, we're not under that right now, even though this is about as New Testament as you can get. <laughs> but, but I don't think you can get around it, okay? But first, let me just show you this and kind of prove that we do clearly see that when in the Bible, women having uh, long hair is something that was just a common, you know, natural thing. All right, first of all, I thought about this. John 12, 3 says, Then, you're familiar with the story, Then took Mary a pound of ointment of spikenard, very costly, and anointed the feet of Jesus, and wiped his feet with her hair. And the house was filled with the odor of the ointment. Now, you have to have fairly long hair to be able to wipe some of his feet. I mean, that'd be kind of weird. <laughs> you know, I don't know how you would do it with the short hair. But I think it's pretty understood. I don't everybody pretty much understood. She had longer hair, enough to actually get down there and wipe, you know, his feet with that. And so that's kind of interesting. But then we also have these two passages that Paul wrote about to, in Tim, uh, to Timothy. And then, no, I'm sorry. Paul wrote to Timothy. And then we'll have Peter uh, writing and giving almost the same words here. First Timothy chapter 2. First Timothy two, verse eight. First Timothy two eight. I will therefore that men pray everywhere, lifting up holy hands without wrath and doubting. In like manner also, the women adorn themselves in modest apparel, with shamefacedness and sobriety, not with broided hair or gold or pearls or costly array but which becometh women professing godliness with good works let the women learn in silence with all subjection okay what is the broided hair all about broided sounds a lot like braided and if you look into that it's pretty much talking about the same thing they had hair long enough to be braided now i could have one of the ladies come up here, because I don't know how to do it so well, but try to braid my hair, it's not going to work. <laughs> my hair's a little too short to be braided. Now, were there men in the Bible, let's just go ahead and put this to rest, were there men in the Bible who could braid their hair? Well, certainly. You know, you had those who took the Nazarite vow, they had long hair. You had Absalom, you know, he had long, beautiful hair. You know, that was his glory. <laughs> but it really wasn't, it's kind of a shame. Just because you find people in the Bible that do something, Contrary to what another com clear command says, don't do this. It's not pleasing to God. That doesn't mean it was okay. That just means that somebody did it, right? right. And so uh, we see these cases. Now you say, what about the Nazarite vow? God commanded that. Well, that's true. But you see, interestingly enough, what you find, the Bible says, doesn't even nature teach you that for a man to have long hair, it's a shame? Well, it really was a shame for a Nazarite to have long hair. It wasn't like, oh, look at that religious man over there, you know? And most of the time when people took a Nazarite vow, I don't think they took it like Samson or Samuel where it was like a lifelong thing. Most of the time they just took a vow. As long as they had the vow, their hair grew out. Kind of like during the COVID-19 lock-in. Barber shut down, you got to let your hair grow out a little bit. Amen. I won't tell you how I got mine cut, but <laughs> a little bit of money after that service under the table. <laughs> That's a joke, all right? Let's wipe that out for the record. So uh, anyway... Uh, it was a shame for men to have long hair. So naturally, when, the, when somebody took a Nazarite vow, that was, I think that was part of what the vow was doing. Is they were walking around in humility, right? And, uh, and it was kind of a shameful thing. But First Peter says something similar on the women having hair. And it says not. What, it, what it's saying in that passage is, is, look, clothe yourself with godliness. Clothe yourself in, in goodly, uh, you know, don't be worried about being flashy. That's right. You know, is it wrong for a woman to braid her hair? No, I don't believe that. It's just saying, don't be like just you know. We're this. We're not talking about the things that you need to adorn yourself with are are godliness, Amen. shamefacedness, which might not mean you know what some people would would think it means, but somebody who is in subjection, acting like a godly lady, right. doing what a, a, a God commands women to do inside in the Bible. Those are the things you need to concerned about putting on, all right? Not putting on all these, you know, uh, flashy things or whatever. So Peter says something uh, similar. 1 Peter 3.3. 3. All right, let's just start with the first one. Likewise, ye wives, 
be in subjection to your own husbands, that if any obey not the word, they also may without the word, I'm sorry, yeah, without the word, be won by the conversation of the wives. While they behold your chaste conversation coupled with fear, whose adorning, let it not be that outward adorning of plating the hair and of wearing of gold and of putting on of apparel. Uh, I mean, women put on apparel, okay? <laughs> it's not saying don't put on apparel. It's saying let that not be the adorning that we're talking about. You're more concerned about what you put on as far as godliness. It's kind of like exercise thyself rather than the godliness, right? Exercise is good. It's not saying don't exercise, right? It's not saying don't wear nice things or whatever, but it's saying that these aren't the important things. Amen. But what it says right here is the plating of the hair. So this is something else that they would do is, uh, if I understand right, what they do, not only braid their hair, but they would weave things into it, you know, de decoration. And, uh, and they would do things, you know, like that. Well, again, a guy can't really do that with short hair. A woman who cuts her hair short can't really do that. So it was just kind of a common tradition, a common thing that women would have long hair. I have used this before and said, look, the Bible says, doesn't even nature teach you that it's, you know, glory for a woman to have long hair. It's a shame for a man to have, have long hair. And they say, what do you mean nature? Nature teach you. Have you looked around at the animal kingdom? You know, what about lions? You know, <laughs> the lions have long hair. <laughs> I'm thinking, yeah, well, the lion's natural state is an animal. <laughs> but it's natural among humans for guys to say, hey, I need to cut my hair, you know, and I need to, uh, uh, I don't know why. I don't know why. Here's an interesting thing. I don't know why this jump, just jumped in my head, but have you ever seen a picture of uh, Martin Luther's haircut? What was the deal with that? <laughs> <laughs> He's got like this bald spot shape. Like I tell you, like he did, I'm getting the bald spot right here. But he like literally shaved his, right? <laughs> and I think maybe that was, uh, I don't know, honestly, but I think it was like an over-exaggeration of this verse, right? I got to have my head uncovered, right? But that verse is talking about certainly women covering with long hair, men not having long hair. And it actually says that this is was important. So if a guy gets up and he's trying to be the prophet, you know, he's trying to pray before God and be spiritual and be godly, and I can't think what that guy's name is, but there's a popular guy that's got these long dreads. Yep. And I'm thinking, man, this guy is literally yep. like, taking this verse and going, you know, just thumbing his nose at it right. and, and saying, that's, I don't care what that says. Because he's standing up there prophesying and praying to God and doing all these things with this long hair. Now you say, well, I don't know. What you, you know, people have different interpretations. You ever hear somebody <laughs> try to explain? Well, people have different interpretations. Yeah, well, I think it's pretty clear, and, and, Amen. and regardless of what you want to try to make that say, I think the Bible says that this is something to be taken seriously. All right? So, if you remember back in uh, 1 Corinthians 11, if you remember, this is at the beginning, he's talking about, hey, this is what, I praise you for this, brethren, you, you remember me, you follow me, even as I follow Christ. You keep my ordinances. You do all these things. So he's talking to this church that he kind of started, and he's imparting all this wisdom to him. And he's saying, "Hey, these are the things. These are the customs. Okay, that we have as we as we honor God. These are the things that, that we need to do." And he begins, as we're talking about right now, telling them about if you pray, prophesy, you got to do it in such, such a way. And then at the end, if you remember, was what we talked about a few weeks ago on the Lord's Supper. And he says, "You got to take this seriously." And you're going into the Lord's Supper and you're taking this, hey, you know, pay attention to what it means, what you're doing. If you do it flippantly, this was the application that I that I uh, attached to it. If you do it flippantly, look, you're just kind of making a mockery out of the cross of Christ. And you're saying it's not a serious thing. And he's saying, you know, it's going to be organized. You're going to do it with the right spirit and the right heart and the right attitude. And that's what's important. So at the beginning, it makes sense then. He's kind of saying the same thing. If you're going to pray prophesy before God. It's important that you do this seriously. You do this with the right attitude. You do this in the proper authority, the proper submission. You, know? you can't just get up here and do it however you want. We talked about recently how 
to obey is better than sacrifice. You can't just get up and say, well, you don't understand. Like, at least I'm praying to God. You know, I, I heard that uh, Joyce Myers uh, get up there, who has short hair, by the way, doesn't she? Gets up there, <laughs> suit pants on, you know, short hair. The Bible says a woman's not supposed to preach, and she gets up there to, 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 to do that. And I literally heard her say, now I know people take me to the Bible where it says that a woman ought not to preach. She says, but... I can't help it. God told me that I'm supposed to do this, and so I'm just doing it. I mean, just like whatever happens to where the Bible says, if any man comes and you know, says something different than what we've told you, you know, let them be accursed. And, and uh, she's like having these special revelations. Get up there. Well, I'm telling you, if you don't take the power of God's word and you say, man, I'm taking this serious. I'm taking this literal. If I don't understand something, I'm just going to go with it and try to be as literal as I can and just take it serious. Right? If you don't do that, you're in danger of having your prayers hindered. Having the prophecy that you try, you're trying to do, the, the, the things that you're trying to do for God, you are, you are at a danger of doing the same thing you did if you walked in and took the Lord's Supper and you just said, hey, man, I'm, I'm kind of hungry. Hey, let's eat more. You know, and you, you took all those things flippantly and you didn't take them seriously. This was something that he's saying, this is important. When you get up there to pray and prophesy, it's a serious thing. So, what does that have to do with angels? I'm going to try to go through this real quickly. What exactly is the job of an angel? We read in Hebrews chapter 1, probably the most times in the Bible where the word angel is used over and over. It's talking about angels and the role of the angel and the, uh, the, the jobs that they have. And so there are several things that an angel does if we look through the Bible in terms of Ministry, okay. Their their job is actually they're like messengers of God, ministers of God, and Hebrews one made that real clear. And so let me just give you some examples. These are primarily going to be Old Testament examples because they're popular stories uh, that we can relate to and we understand. Okay, number one, what do the angels do? Angels have the ministry of carrying messages to and from God's people, right? So they take a message from God, deliver it to people. They take a message from people who are praying, and they deliver that prayer to God. I don't know exactly how that works, okay, but we see evidence of that in the Bible. The angels play a part in that, according to the Bible. Let's start with Genesis chapter 16. Genesis 16. And this is the story of Hagar, all right? You know the story between Sarah, she couldn't have a child, and talks Abraham into sleeping with Hagar and having a child uh, with her. Chapter uh, 16, verse 6 says, But Abraham said unto Sarah, uh, Behold, thy maid is in thy hand, do to her as it pleaseth thee. And when Sarah dealt hardly with her, she fled from her face, okay? If you catch the story here she's super jealous of Hagar so Sarah begins to treat her badly and because now she has a child and Sarah doesn't and the angel of the Lord found her by the fountain of water in the wilderness by the fountain in the way to Shur and he said Hagar Sarah's maid whence comest thou and whither wilt thou go and she said I flee from the face of my mistress Sarah and the angel of the Lord said unto her, Return to thy mistress, and submit thyself unto her hands. And the angel of the Lord said unto her, I will multiply thy seed exceedingly, that it shall uh, not be numbered for multitude. And the angel of the Lord said unto her, Behold, thou art with child, and shall bear a son, and shall call his name Ishmael, because uh, the Lord hath heard thy affliction. So we see cases in the Bible where, where you know, Somebody cries out to God. And I believe this. Sometimes our cry out to God isn't even something that's necessarily audible or intelligent. Right? The Bible talks about the Spirit of God bear, uh, making intercession for us when we don't know what to pray. But sometimes just somebody's grief and their affliction and their pain. Uh, God will just hear that. All right? And an angel, is in, in this case, is receiving that. And, and he's letting her know, hey, God had heard thy affliction, okay? In uh, Genesis 18, then, as you follow the story, 
when you get to Genesis 18, there is a messenger that comes to Abraham and to Sarah. And in this case, there are actually three men. One is the Lord. It's, uh, you know, I'm not going to go into great length on this, but it says, And the Lord appeared unto him in the plains of Mamre, and he sat in the tent door in the heat of the day, and lifted up his eyes and looked, and lo, uh, three men stood by him. And when he saw them, he ran to meet them from the tent door and bowed himself toward the ground and said, My Lord, if now I have found favor in thy sight. <clears throat> Pass not away, I pray thee, from my servant. And he talks him into staying, having something to eat, and all this, and and he runs in, and uh, and he gets he makes preparation, you know, for them for the meal. And in verse nine, he this uh, the, the, one of the messengers says, "Where is Sarai, thy wife? Sarah, thy wife?" And he said, "Behold, in the tent." And he begins to deliver this message about how Sarah is going to conceive in her old age and have Isaac. So here we see that uh, this this uh, angel is carrying the message right back and forth carrying the message from god he's the spokesperson if you look up angel and this morning in sunday school i was actually we did a little study on the word evangelist okay the bible doesn't use the word a whole lot but it's clear when the bible is talking about an evangelist this is somebody who goes out and delivers glad tidings good news all right so when we go on evangelist we would say maybe in our modern term we would say a missionary Somebody who goes out and preaches the gospel or a soul winner. They're doing the work of an evangelist, all right? And the root word of evangelist is what? Angel. angel. Okay, so this angel's a messenger. So this angel's natural job is going to deliver good tidings, glad tidings, right? And they're going to come down and think about the angels that came to the shepherds and said, Behold, I bring you glad tidings of great joy that should be upon all people and is announcing the birth of Christ. And so the angels have this ministry of carrying messages to and from God. One more example. Look at Daniel chapter 10. Daniel chapter 10. This is a great passage here. Daniel chapter 10. Follow along. I know we're doing a lot of reading uh, this afternoon, but uh, it's good. You know, let the Bible speak for itself. In the third year of Cyrus, king of Persia, a thing was revealed unto Daniel, whose name was called Belteshazzar. And the thing was true, but the time appointed was long. And he understood the thing and had understanding of the vision. In those days, I, Daniel, was mourning three full weeks. How long is three weeks? How many days? 21. 21 days. Okay. I ate no pleasant bread, neither came flesh nor wine in my mouth, neither did I anoint myself at all. Until three whole weeks was fulfilled. And in the four and twentieth day of the first month, as I was by the side of the great river, which is Hittichel, then I lifted up my eyes and looked, and behold, a certain man clothed in linen, whose loins were girded with fine gold of Euphaz. His body also was like the barrel, and his face as the appearance of lightning and his eyes as lamps of fire, and his arms and his feet like the color of polished brass. And the voice of his words were like the voice of a multitude. Interestingly, go through the Bible. If you do a study on this sometime. I, can, I, I got a whole bunch of verses. If you want me to help you with the study, I, I can give them to you. And just look up all the times an angelic being is seen, whether it's cherubim or just some messenger that comes in bright clothing. And oftentimes it's going to be uh, uh, described very much like this. And I, Daniel, alone saw the vision, for the men that were with me saw not the vision, but a great quaking fell upon them, so that they fled to hide themselves. Therefore I was left alone and saw this great vision, and there remained no strength in me. That's another thing that happens when people have a direct message from God or a revelation from God. They, uh, they have no strength in them. They are speechless. For my comeliness was turned in me into corruption, and I retained no strength. Yet heard I the voice of his words, and when I heard the voice of his words, then was I in a deep sleep on my face, and my face toward the ground. And behold, a hand touched me, which set me upon my knees, and upon the palms of my hands. And he said unto me, O Daniel, man greatly beloved, understand the words that I speak unto thee, and stand, stand upright. For unto thee am I now sent. And when he had spoken this word to, unto me, I stood trembling. Then said he unto me, Fear not, this part I want you to notice, verse 12. 
He said unto me, Fear not, Daniel, for from the first day that thou didst set thine heart to understand and to chasten thyself before thy God, thy words were heard, and I am come for thy words. But the prince of the kingdom of Persia withstood me one and twenty days. How many weeks is that? <laughs> Three weeks, which is what he was praying and fasting. And then he said, and he came, uh, came to help me, and I remained there with the kings of Persia. Now I am come to make thee understand what shall befall uh, thy people in the latter days, for yet the vision is for many days. So anyway, I just wanted you to see that here Daniel is saying, you know, for three weeks I fasted and I continued to pray, which by the way, it's not wrong to do that. It's not wrong to say, hey, well, God knows what I need, and so I'm just going to wait for him to give it to me or whatever. It's not wrong for you to actually uh, discomfort yourself and, and pray to God and maybe fast and pray or whatever. The Bible says that's one way that we can get a hold of God. But in this case, he's saying, look, you've been doing that for three weeks. I heard you from the first day that you delivered that prayer. I heard you, right? But I was going and, and all these things uh, came uh, came up and I was in a fight and all this kind of stuff. But how many times when we pray and you know, we just trust, we're just hoping that God's hearing our prayer and he's going to answer our prayer, you know, we don't know what kind of a what kind of a spiritual battle is going on. We don't know who's trying to deliver the message and and uh, and what's coming of that. And so we just we just wait, right? We just keep praying and we keep seeking that. But you know, the Bible says there's actually angels, like angel angelic beings, like messengers of God, who are involved in carrying those messages and thinking, I don't understand how it all works, but uh, but that's something that we see in the Bible. Number one, angels have the ministry of carrying messages to and from God's people. Number two, angels have the ministry of delivering judgment of God. All right, you can you continue reading that story that we started in Genesis 16, Genesis 18. By the time you get to Genesis 18 and Genesis 19, what do you see those angels doing? They go down to Sodom and Gomorrah, all right? God, uh, it says that the Lord stays and talks with Abraham and the other two angels go down into Sodom and Gomorrah, and we know what they're fixing to do. They're fixing to drag Lot out of that city and his daughters with him and, and his wife, who ends up obviously looking back, and destroys that city. The angels are, are part of delivering God's judgment. Now, I don't know exactly how this, how this works, but as we see in the Bible so oftentimes, God will allow... You know, it's hard for us to think of God allowing any evil to come on somebody because the Bible says God cannot be tempted with evil, neither can he tempt any man, right, of, of evil. But God has messengers. And, and, and anything that God pours out on somebody in that kind of way as far as judgment is by the hand of God. I mean, make no mistake about it. You say, oh, God's so loving and merciful and he would never do that. No, no, no. When God's wrath, you know, uh, boils over, Right, he's going to pour out his wrath, but he does that by sending ministers. Okay, these are oftentimes in the Bible uh, called angels. Okay, if you look back in Exodus 12, let's look real quickly. Exodus 12. I know this is more of a Bible study, not some exciting preaching, but bear with me. Okay, we're going to get we're going to make some application here in a minute. Exodus chapter 12. Verse 23. This is the story of the Passover. Hey, Zachary, we grabbed that water bottle. In there. This is the story of the Passover. You're, you're familiar with that. Now, what do a lot of people call the angel that came and, uh, thank you, the angel that came and caused the firstborn of every house, the firstborn male, to be killed? A lot of times people say, well, it was the death angel. You ever heard that? Which actually isn't something that's in the Bible at all. It's just something that somebody made up. But you know what the Bible actually calls him? is a destroying angel, okay? Now look at Exodus chapter 12, verse 23. For the Lord will pass through to smite the Egyptians, and when he seeth the blood upon the lintel and on the two side posts, the Lord will pass over the door and will not suffer the destroyer to come in unto your houses to smite you. Now, Let's go over to Ezekiel chapter 9. Keep that in mind. The destroyer. Ezekiel 9. 
And Ezekiel's got some deep prophetic application to this little to this passage here in the vision that he's seeing. And in the in this vision, he's going to see a, an an angelic being, uh, and he's supposed God's going to pour out his fury upon all these uh, all, all these guys in his, in uh, Jerusalem. And he cried also in my ears with a loud voice, saying, Cause them that have charge over the city to draw near, every, uh, even every man with his destroying weapon in his hand. And behold, six men came from the way of the higher gate, which lieth toward the north, and every man a slaughter weapon in his hand. I love that phrase, a slaughter weapon. And one man among them was clothed with linen, and with a writer's inkhorn by his side, and they went in and stood beside the brazen altar, and the glory of God of Israel was gone up from the cherub, whereupon he was, to the threshold of the house. And he called to the man clothed with linen that had the writer's inkhorn by his side. And the Lord said unto him, Go through the midst of the city, through the midst of Jerusalem, and set a mark upon the foreheads of the men that sigh and to cry for all the abominations that be done in the midst thereof. And to the others he said, uh, In my hearing, go ye after him through the city and smite. Let not your eyes spare, neither have pity. Slay utterly old and young, both maid and little children and women. But come not near any man upon whom is the mark, and begin at the, my sanctuary. Then they began at the ancient men, uh, which were before the house. And it goes on. And I'm sure that reminds you of another story, is it not? Let me read to you Revelation 7. Revelation 7, 1 through 3 says this. After these things, I saw four angels standing on the four corners of the earth, holding the four winds of the earth, that the wind should not blow on the earth, nor on the sea, nor on any tree. And I saw another angel ascending from the east, having the seal of the living God. And he cried with a loud voice in the, uh, to the four angels, to whom it was given to hurt the earth and the sea, saying, Hurt not the earth, neither the sea, nor the trees, till we have sealed the servants of our God in the forehead. So a similar thing going on. You've got one angel that's going, and he's marking these people in their foreheads. And then you got, when the time comes, these other angels are going to pour out God's wrath upon those who don't have the mark on their forehead. And of course, that case in Revelation is talking about the 144,000. So all throughout the Bible, we see angels being used to deliver God's wrath. We don't think about that oftentimes. We think of it as just, you know, hey, God, boom, he says something and it happens, right? Which is, you know, true. God spoke the world into existence, right? But we also see that Jesus was the instrument behind that, the word of God, right? It created all things. I don't completely understand because the spiritual world is, is, is beyond our comprehension, I believe. But somehow angels are used not only to carry messages to and from God's people, but also to carry out the judgment and to deliver the judgment upon uh, whoever uh, God's wrath is poured out on. Number three, angels have the ministry of comforting the hurting people when they cry out to God. We talked about Hagar and God saw their affliction. Uh, I'm not going to take time to go there, but in Genesis 21, a similar thing happens. Ishmael is now with her, right? And they're out in the wilderness, and they ran out of water. Ishmael's going to die. And then an angel comes and says, I heard the lad, fear not. And he comes, and he begins to comfort her and all this. Also, we see in the Bible, look at 1 Kings 19. 1 Kings 19. You know, I'm just scratching the surface. There are stories all throughout the Bible of angels, a lot that we don't understand about angelology, but uh, there are certainly plenty of references in the Bible to angelic beings. Okay, First Kings nineteen. <clears throat> First Kings nineteen, and Ahab told Jezebel. Don't you like reading about those two? And Ahab told Jezebel all that Elijah had done, and with or how he had slain all the prophets with the sword, sniffling to his wife. Do you believe this? I'm going to And Jezebel sent the messenger unto Elijah, saying, So let the gods do to me, and more also, if I make not thy life as the life of one of them by tomorrow about this time. And when he saw that, he arose and went for his life 
and came to Beersheba, which belongeth to Judah, and left his servant there. But he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness, and came and sat down under the juniper tree, and he requested for himself that he might die, and said, It is enough now, O Lord, take away my life, for I am not better than my father's. And as he lay and slept under the juniper tree, behold, then an angel touched him and said unto him, Arise and eat. And he looked, and behold, there was a cake baked on the coals and a cruise of water at his head, and he did eat and drink and laid him down again. And the angel of the Lord came again a second time, and he touched him and said, Arise, eat, because the journey is too great for thee. And he arose and did eat and drink and went in the strength of the meat forty days and forty nights unto Horeb, the uh, mountain of God. So you see this angel is being used to give comfort to Elijah during this time and to provide Elijah with the, the meat and to, and to provide uh, something that he didn't even know he was going to get. Okay, but he's just crying out to God, and God says, I'm going to send one of my angels. I'm going to send one of my messengers, and they're going to take care of this for you. So, so number four, I'm just trying to move on real quickly here. Number four, this is very similar, but angels protect God's people. One more story. Look at 2 uh, Kings. Here in 1 Kings, look at 2 Kings. One more story. 2 Kings chapter 6. This is just to remind you that... We don't think much about the, the spiritual world. We don't think about angels' involvement in the acts of God and the things that happen on a day-to-day -day basis. Even like we said with Daniel, says a prayer. He doesn't know how that's being delivered. I don't understand it, but I'm reading about it in the Bible saying, hey, there's something to this. So this is the unseen world. Elisha uh, gives his servant a glimpse into, uh, into this spiritual world. 2 Kings chapter 6, verse 15. And when the servant of the man of God was risen early and gone forth, behold, an host compassed the city, both with horses and chariots. And his servant, said unto, his servant said unto him, Alas, my master, how shall we do? He's looking around saying, hey, we don't have, there's no hope. I mean, look at all these horses and the uh, soldiers around us. Uh, we're in big trouble. And he, Elisha, answered, Fear not. For they that be with us are more than they that be with them. So here's Elisha's servant, right? He's saying, uh-oh, we're surrounded, we're in trouble. Elisha, what are we going to do? Elisha said, oh, don't worry. There's more on our side than there are on his side. You can see Elisha's servant going like, <laughs> what are you talking about? There's only two of us. And we're surrounded by these horses and these soldiers. What are you talking about? And Elisha prayed and said, Lord, I pray thee, open his eyes. See, Elisha was experienced. Uh, I'm preaching about this tonight in Iola, but I, Elisha had received a double portion of Elijah's spirit. <laughs> Elisha, his eyes is open. He's been through this. He's been with his, uh, his master, you know, Elijah, and he's seen the hand of God. He's seen the spiritual world. And here uh, he says, open his eyes that he may see. And look what happens when he opens his eyes. The Lord opened the eyes of the young man, and he saw, and behold, the mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire round about Elisha. And they came down uh, and, and, they, and they came down to him. Elisha prayed to the Lord and said, Smite this people, I pray thee, with blindness. And he smote them with blindness according to the word of Elisha. Isn't that encouraging to know as, as a child of God, you say, you know, you believe in uh, guardian angels. Well, I don't know that that word, that phrase isn't really in the Bible, so I don't know how that works. I'm not necessarily going to say that every person is assigned one guardian angel, you know, for their life. I mean, people have come up with all these different ideas on that. But here's what I know. God's going to protect you if you're his child. And the way he's going to do that is through surrounding you by angels. I don't know how, but we see that even with Jesus. Jesus is being tempted by the devil and all these kinds of things. And in the end, he's ministered to by angels. I mean, angels come to minister to us. They deliver our messages. They deliver messages to us from God. Uh, they do all these things. They have a ministry. That's why they're called ministers of righteousness, okay? They protect us. They do all these things. So, the message really has nothing to do with women's hair. Okay. Long hair in a woman? Praise the Lord. I think it should be. All right. I think it's a sign of submission. 
It's a sign of the role that the woman has. She's not usurping authority. All those kinds of things that we see in the church that a lady is supposed to be, they're saying, hey, if you're going to pray, you're going to prophesy, you ought to do it this way. You ought to do it in subjection. You ought to do it with the right spirit. All these kinds of things. What does that have to do with long hair? Well, it's not really the hair that it's talking about. But then it does say that interesting phrase where it says about the power on their head, right? Let's go back and read it. Hebrews, I mean not Hebrews, uh, 1 Corinthians. Eleven ten. Thank you. Verse 10, for this cause ought the woman to have power on her head because of the woman. He's making the issue out of this particular subject of having the, the woman having her head covered, okay? And being in subjection and all this kind of thing. He's making the issue out of that. But this phrase where he says, uh, have power on her head because of the angels, I can't help but make this application. Angels are, are constantly around us. Angels are watching us. I, I don't know if I've told you this before or not, but I remember whenever I was a kid, I amused with this idea. I don't know how much I actually believed it, but I amused with this idea that every living being, including flies, fleas, I mean, microscopic thing, anything that had eyes that was living, right, could somehow, was somehow watching us. And everything we did, whether good or bad, it's reporting our behavior. And God's like basically looking through their eyes, like these cameras all over. Hey, it's, hey you know, the government's watching now. <laughs> Maybe they've put stuff in these uh, 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 flies and stuff. I don't know. <laughs> I'm just kidding. But I always felt like I was being watched. You know, I always felt like there was no privacy. And in actuality, if you think about it, Hey, look, there's nothing you can do that's hid from God. Right, right. There's nothing you can do that God doesn't know about it. And I don't care if he's just like, do we know he's all places? You know, there's nowhere we can go where he's not. So I don't know if he sees everything at the same time. It doesn't really make matter. It doesn't really matter to me how he does it. Maybe there's just so many innumerable amount of angels that are everywhere that these angels are seeing and they're reporting. I don't know how it happens, but I know this. You are being watched. <laughs> You are being watched. The angels are watching you. Now, people have tried to make this story mean some weird things. They took an old Jewish uh, teaching that goes back to the time of Noah, where it says the sons of God, you know, came and, and uh, cohabited with the daughters of man. I don't remember exactly how it says it. And so they said, well, that's talking about the sons of God there, talking about angels, and these angels came, and they had relationships with the, with the, uh, the, son, with the daughters of men, and, which doesn't even make sense because Jesus says that that, that can't happen, <laughs> right? And they began to believe all this kind of stuff, and so when they get this, they say, here, the long hair, you get, they got to make sure they don't have long hair or else the angels are going to be tempted to sin with them. Have you ever heard of that? Like people think that that's the reason that they got to make sure they have long hair because maybe they're going to cause the angels to lust after them. I've heard all kinds of weird stuff. I'm not saying I know for sure that I'm 100% right on my interpretation of this verse, but here's what I know. Angels are watching us all the time. Why are they watching us? What are they waiting to do? Well, they're waiting to deliver a message from God to us. They're waiting to hear our messages that we're praying and prophet, you know, prophesying and trying to get out. They're going to carry that out for us. They're waiting to protect us. They're waiting to uh, uh, deliver us from the judgments of God. Right? They're waiting to um, protect us from harm because we're God's people and all that. And Hebrews 13.2 says this, Be not forgetful to entertain strangers. For thereof, some have entertained angels unaware. Look, I don't really have to tell you what that verse means. <laughs> Here's all you have to know. Angels are watching you. They're everywhere. You say, well, I don't think that's what that angel means. Maybe it's talking about uh, an evangelist. Or, well, that could be. But be not careful to entertain strangers. Thereby, uh, some have entertained angels unaware. We need to realize that we're being watched by these ministers of God. They're waiting to carry out the orders of the Lord. 
And so get this. So when we pray or we prophesy in the name of the Lord, we don't want to do it in vain. We don't want to pray and it not mean anything. We don't want to prophesy and it doesn't mean anything. We ought to make sure we're doing it in the right manner, similar to the Lord's Supper. If you're going to do the Lord's Supper, and this is symbolic, right? You're trying to really just reflect on what Jesus did for us, and it be a spiritual time of, of remembrance. And then you just walk in and don't take it seriously. He says, man, that's, that's a bad deal. You don't want to do that. Okay, and so the same manner is when you're ministering in such a way, hey, let's get together and have a prayer meeting. Hey, let's get together and do some preaching. Let's get together and, and, and do these things. All these spiritual things, we have to take it seriously because the angels are watching. Now, recently, maybe you've heard this story, but uh, several preachers, uh, from what I understand, mainstream uh they would be, all be assemblies of God type preachers. Have got up and said stuff like this. I rebuke the coronavirus. <laughs> Have you said any of that? Yeah. I rebuke the coronavirus. Right? Meanwhile, you know, this person who's not in subjection to God's word, <laughs> disobeying all the commandments that God said, and saying, oh, no, I have this special vision. You don't understand. You know, making prophecies about the the rapture coming and then they don't happen, right? The Bible says that that man ought to be put to death. Yeah. <laughs> and right. He makes a prophecy about the rapture coming and it doesn't happen, but he just keeps on going. And now you really think you can say, rebuke you coronavirus <laughs> with the wrong motivation, with the wrong spirit, the wrong attitude, not in submission to God. No, that's not going to mean anything. In fact, you know what would probably happen to the guy who gets up there and says such a thing in the wrong spirit and with the wrong motivation, probably the destroying angel is going to come and make sure he gets destroyed. You know, so I read where somebody says, oh, he gets up there and says, and I just keep using this, this illustration because it's where we are in our culture right now, but this illustration because this guy got up and says, you know, forget you. God told me that nobody in this church is going to get affected, right? So let's just, you know, go about and do life as normal. But I don't even care if this coronavirus is all fake and it doesn't even exist. God might make sure that that preacher gets it <laughs> or something similar, gets the effects of it, right? Because he's trying to pray in vain. He's coming to the Lord, using the Lord's name in vain. That's the real interpretation of using the Lord's name in vain. And he's calling out things and saying, by the power of God, in, his, in God's name, I rebuke you, coronavirus. Look, man, God's not taking you seriously. The angels aren't, answering, aren't going to carry your prayer to God, right? Because of the uh, attitude and the spirit by which they did it. And the lack of obedience, the lack of really submitting to God's word. They don't care what God's word says. They just want what they want. And God's not going to answer that. If you want to hear from God, be in the proper place and submit yourself to your head, your authority. If you want to avoid being punished by God, approach him in a humble manner, in a serious manner. If you want to hear your cry, if you want God to hear, rather, your cries, as you cry out to him, you want him to hear, you better approach him with the right spirit. And if you want him to protect you from harm, you better come to him with the right attitude. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word. We know so little about the spiritual world, but we accept it by faith like we do all of the Bible, and we understand that things are happening that we can hardly understand in our minds, uh, and we do submit, Lord, to your word. We do want to obey you and trust you uh, so that our prayers can be heard and answered and so that we can... Uh, have the proper communication with you, Lord, and uh, that you would protect us, keep us from harm's way. I do pray, Lord, that you will see us, find us faithful, uh, and find us humble, humble and ready to uh, repent of unforgiven sins. And I uh, pray that you would just bless your people now, Jesus. Amen.